Lucy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice. This is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine. Use the machinima, Luke. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Now for Something Completely Machinima. I'm Damien Valentine, and I'm joined by Ricky Grove and Tracy Hello. Howard. Hello. Good to be here. Uh, yeah. As I mentioned last week, uh, Phil is doing hurricane uh, cleanup. He's completely fine. You don't need to worry about him. He, he's just incredibly busy at the moment, but he'll be returning to us next month, which we uh, greatly look forward to because we miss him. Yeah, uh, I, I miss his Hello. comment. He always brings a great yeah. perspective to everything that it's different from the three of us, and then I, I miss him dearly. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'd very much like to have heard his thoughts on uh, this film because it's made by one of his favorite in one of his mm. favorite games. Yes. Um, yeah. So we're going to be talking about the film called The Loss. It's made in Red Dead Redemption 2 by Avid Red Dead Enjoyer. Um, I checked out his channel and he's got quite a few films made with uh, Red Dead Redemption. But I decided to go with this one. It's actually the first one that I discovered. And it's for the most part, it's in black and white, and it kind of has that um, old Western vibe to it, which I think the black and white really in, um, enhances. And there's a couple of color moments which I was quite intrigued by because normally in a film, if you've got a flashback, that's in black and white, uh, but the main film is in color. But this is reverses that the flashback's in color, but the film is in black and white. Mm. Uh, so I quite like that as a, Ingenious. As a twist. The plot of the film is about this lone gunman who is he's on a one a one man revenge quest you don't really find out what he's avenging it the flashbacks are a little bit vague in that regard uh but he's obviously out to looking for justice or, or against whoever did him wrong and i was very impressed by the way it was shot it's some stunning camera work and some action sequences and i remember from previous discussions with Phil and from you, Ricky, about how difficult it is to make films in Red Dead Redemption. Indeed. And uh, yeah, which is why I'm kind of sad that Phil's not here to share his experience with that, with making his own Red mm -hmm. Dead uh, film. But, you know, this filmmaker has done an excellent job despite those difficulties. And I was very impressed by that. And I thought, well, this is going to be my pick. For the month so i thought well here it is what do you guys think well You'll let mean... me follow up you can finish because you usually have a lengthy dive down in it and so i don't want to be the person after that <laughs> fair <laughs> enough <laughs> i'm a big fan of westerns and i do miss phil's presence here because he knows the ins and outs of how to shoot in um, red dead redemption and the difficulties that the filmmaker had in, in trying to get all those shots. Um, uh, as a fan of the Western, I've watched many, many, many Westerns, and I read a lot of Westerns as well, and I've read quite a bit of the history of the Western. This is a film made by somebody who knows the Western, and they know the tropes. The story itself is not particularly original. Uh, you could see the lone gunman figure um, seeking some sort of vengeance or retribution in countless Western films. What really stands out is the ability for the author, to, the filmmaker, to draw you into the story and the beauty of the cinematography uh, of the film, the choices that were made, the editing style, the quickness and the slowness of editing choices all the way through. Uh, they were very impressive. I found myself, as I mentioned in my last one, we talked about engagement. Despite the fact that the story was, I wouldn't say it was cliched, but it was fairly predictable. Um, after that first gun gun battle, it, it, it's really great. It's very much from uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Three uh, bad guy gunslingers are waiting at the train station 
for the person to get off and then they have a big gun battle and all of that. This guy kind of tricked them and then uh, came up and they had a gun battle and it was just masterfully done with echoes of the good, bad and the ugly. So I think this filmmaker knows uh, uh, Western films very well. There were many sequences. I love the flashbacks in color that gave a richness to, to everything that was so well done. The only problem with um, Red Dead Redemption is it's better in mid shots and wide shots than they are in close ups. Because in order to get to, to make the game playable on your PC, they couldn't spend an, amazing, an enormous, enormous amount of time texturing faces because most players are not going to see the people in, in close-ups. They're going to see them in sort of mid-shots away from them and in, in, in interacting with them. So when they did uh, face shots, the faces were somewhat clay-like, which has always been a personal problem for me. But because it was a convention, I knew what the convention was, I accepted it and it was fine. But I think that could have been improved. I don't know exactly how, but I wish they could have done something with it. And the last thing I want to say about this excellent film, which you must see, everybody must see, it, Red Dead Redemption deserves to have more people making films in it, is the music choices. There were two choices of music in it, one classical and one sort of westerny with a organ uh, featuring prominently in it. I had trouble with those because they pulled me out of the film. Um, but I want to hear what you guys thought about them. Uh, and, and I think there could have been different choices than Chopin and um, the other pieces of music that I think would have fit better with the the uh, the ambience and the look and the landscape of everything. But but I'm eager to hear what you guys have to say. So those are my thoughts. Mm. Yeah. Now, I like you guys really miss Phil's input onto this in, into this as well, because he's made a couple of brilliant Red Dead Redemption uh, films that um, play with very similar approaches, I think, um, to the ones that have been used in this. But I think what what first struck me about this was the um, the sentiment, <laughs> Ricky, this is you, the sentimentality in the film. And by that, I don't mean uh, so much in terms of the characters and their portrayal of emotive roles, such as the loss of the brother. Um, but I mean between the director and the genre of film, the older Western and the cowboy lifestyle, I think mm. that that sentiment is what struck me the strongest with this. Um, and there are very many signifiers in this. Uh, and, and it begins with that steam train, um, mm. uh, which is the, you know, the, ver the, the first thing, the sound quality for that steam train is just yeah. outstanding. Um, yeah. I don't even know if that's in the game or whether that's something. It is. That, really, that's brilliant. That's absolutely amazing. Um, to the gunfight of the OK Corral kind of bit, um, to the to John Wayne's searches, you know, standing in the doorway, there was that kind of bit in it. Um, to the 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 music and and I also thought some of the references to the Virginian, you know, the TV uh, cowboy played by James Drury, you know, the man with no name kind of thing. Mm. Though that 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 to me was the sent sentimentality in this, not necessarily in terms of what you saw on the on the screen. Now, obviously, there's no dialogue in this. Again, we had a um, a film last week also where there was no dialogue, no dialogue in this either. Um, we have reviewed things in a similar vein in the past. Um, Phil's Obit a couple of years back was a another such example where somehow the actions and the behaviour portrayed by, as you said, Ricky, these clay-like characters still conveys a story. Right. With the, with the, I don't know, some, it's, it's maybe the, through the stance or the movement somehow. I mean, it, it's very, it's very interesting how you can get a sense of the story with just that kind of stilted well, movement. I think you, you have to credit the filmmaker 
because the filmmaker sets up those shots. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. And, which is why this you could take this film and put it in the traditional Western films and it was fit right in. It it would like indeed. Boddicker's films, Anthony Mann, many other film Ford, even John Ford, it would fit right into them. It indeed it would. But I gotta say, without that one line of introduction on the description of the film, I'm not wholly sure I would have been able to grasp exactly what this was about. Ah. Um because you know when it, at, the, at the beginning at the, with the arrival and that that the dominance of that train scene and the sound um i got lost in that a little bit because i was expecting something to be connected to that um but it wasn't really until the middle of the film that it seems to suggest what's going on and and that you know we've got our bounty hunter um whom by all accounts had previously been in town and discovered that his brother had been murdered, which then seems to have set him off on this kind of manhunt, resulting him to sort of search them out and then lead them back to the town. And I think if you think about, or at least ways my interpretation of it, I think if I thought about it too much, you'd realise it's a bit of a recursive plot. And it kind of ties you in knots a little bit because you don't know where... Ultimately, when you you're reflecting on it, you don't know where the beginning or the the middle or the end actually was in it. Um, which is yeah, but which... but the thing is, is that if you're a Western fan, you know that for that sure. All the time. They don't give you the setup right off the bat. Uh, Indeed, there's a filmmaker named Bud Boddicker who did about five different westerns, and they all had that element into them. You don't really see how the beginning connects until a certain key moment occurs and then you suddenly get it so if you're a western fan you recognize that definitely right off the bat. definitely that's what i mean about the sentimentality between the director and the genre hmm. um i really like the black and white and scratchy style of it i thought that was yeah. great um yeah. fitted in perfectly with that sentiment and the overall feel i you know when i was um, looking at it i wasn't really too sure what those color sections were about um or what they were there to portray or indeed kind of how they fitted into the black and whiteness of the other sections um because they had a kind of different style to them they were kind of running free and in the end i kind of thought well maybe what they are is a memory of good times with the much loved brother that was no longer there that was that's, my sense that's what that's what you thought as and well mine, yeah oh, okay because i yeah. wasn't too sure exactly but then in the end I, that was I don't know. That's what I sort of concluded from it, but but I wasn't sure that was really what he intended. Um, the sound I did like you, Ricky. I thought it was a little bit disjointed, but actually, what disjointed it for me wasn't the music so much as the um, distant cows and dogs and the hammering and such. Um, and I guess they weren't as good as that steam train, <laughs> and and <laughs> and the editing that he'd done to its movement i mean there's a little shot right in the beginning where um something happens in the in the film and you get two puffs of smoke from the from the the train just bang on cue it's really well done that bit was really well done the movement and the animation and what it was 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 incredibly well done um but i suppose what disappointed me about it was it didn't ultimately have much of a role other than perhaps to set the time period um, and in fact, I think I got so wrapped up in that in that train at the beginning of the film, it brought back something which I remember, um, uh, you know, uh, coming across many, many years ago when I worked, it's a little bit of insight for you, when I worked on a magazine called Steam World. Um, and I don't know if, it, Ricky, you might well know this story, but apparently um, Kirk Douglas in his cowboy acting days was a passionate train fan and would often go off with some equipment uh, on set to record steam trains in his downtime and for one of the issues of steam world magazine we once put this cassette recording i think it was, a, it was either a cassette or a video anyway um of all these different uh, train steam train sounds um which he'd apparently record recorded from his you know his years of being on all sorts of film sets um and I can remember listening to this and thinking, what the hell's that all about? Why on earth would he do that? Because <laughs> they were sort of slow trains, you know, chuffing, and then these faster trains 
you know, that kind of thing. And then a bit of to tooting and what have you. Um, but I remember being hugely surprised that that magazine completely sold out every single uh, copy. Um, wow. Which I couldn't, I, yeah, why? I don't know. Um, I actually tried to look it up uh, to see if I could find a link to the magazine and see if you could get any copies of that old cassette. I'm sure I've still got it upstairs in the attic somewhere. Mm. somewhere. It's probably mid-1990s, but that train sound took me back to that uh, uh, that kind of memory of how people love to record um, the sounds of those beautiful trains. And I've no doubt that that's if it's in the game, that that's that's the sort of source material that would have come from somebody, somebody's archive like that, as it would be original sound, I'm sure. Right. Anyway, back to back to the film. There's this kind of this um, early shot, which to me sort of. Uh, actually indicates a bit of anachronism for me in, in terms of style. And, and given that its aim was largely to present an old style Western, there's this one um, shot where, where after this main character has killed these three folks at the train stop, the camera then sort of goes up in the air and jumps over the buildings and then comes down into the main street, you know, a little way behind our cowboy riding out um through the town from this really high perspective uh and then the camera sort of drops and follows him down down the street as he's as he's riding through and it's all one wide sweep well in my memory of seeing hundreds of westerns as well you wouldn't have seen a shot like that i thought it was a really interesting shot but you would not have ever seen a shot like that you'd see lots and lots of different cuts Lots of different angles, probably from, you know, high up on the buildings, but never, you know, way up over the building like that. So I thought that was an interesting, uh, an interesting approach and a slightly, you know, something that you've almost never seen with a with an old style cowboy, um, which I thought was an intriguing strategy. Um, we've often seen. I mean, we've often sort of said, haven't we, how things done with machinima are things that can never be done in real life. Well, I think that's a classic example of oh, how yeah. using the game can uh, can be used, you know, you can use it to do things that you could never do in real life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that was a, that to me, because of what, of what was going on and because of the love with the genre was so evident in this, that jumped me out a little bit. Mm. Um which is kind of intriguing. Um, and then again, I was thinking, you know, Phil made another Red Dead Redemption film where he actually played with the with the genre and with the glitch in the game itself. Not that this is glitch, but, you know, he, he sort of played on what the game was capable of, which is, do you remember that one, that really sort of comedy short mm. where, where that horse and rider were sort of, riding up into the air and then suddenly it all breaks and it drops the <laughs> right remember that one? well yeah, he yeah. made he made fun of the, the the sort of thing that you could get in the game that you couldn't get anywhere else and i i guess it's it's probably worth remembering that you're not just talking or not just thinking here about film but also how game has unique properties that you need to integrate as well um but overall, I love this. Um, it was really, really good fun. Um, it did raise a few questions for me in, in terms of, you know, can you always be faithful to a genre with a, with a you know, using game mechanics? Um, I guess I'd be really interested to hear what you guys thought about that, whether you picked it up or whether you it didn't jump you out or... Didn't, didn't affect me at all. My idea is if you're going to do a film in 2024 inside of a game, and if you're going to be true to the genre, you don't have to be true to the cinematography of the genre. You can be true to the look, the feel, the mood, the landscape, but you don't necessarily have to limit yourself to that camera on a tripod mm -hmm. uh, approach that was so simple and easy for early Westerns. If you have ability to make shots that are different, then do that. It didn't pull me out of it at all. In fact, 
that was one of the things that I really admired about the filmmaker uh, in this film is his use of camera movement. That one shot you you talk about was such a marvelous, mm. but because he used it to do something very modern, which is the a character starts moving in one direction, you pass through a number of architectural and landscape elements, and then they appear at the end of the shot, having gone through it in real time. Mm -hmm. I always thought that added to the realism of the, despite the fact that the camera shot was unusual and not what you would see in normal Westerns, it was quite revealing as far as the realism mm -hmm. of the situation, you know? So that didn't make any difference to me. The music was more of an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I agree with you, Ricky, about the, the camera work, because obviously when those Westerns were made, they probably didn't have the camera technology to do a shot like that. If they made a Western now, yeah, they could do that. You sure, could a, drone a drone shot, they got it. a drone, they'd run a drone over it, and they'd be fine. Yeah. So, yeah, I just see this as a filmmaker using the technology available to him, which is this game, and the camera controls in it, um, to tell the story he wanted. I, he's it's not, it didn't jump out at me because I, I think it's just a way to put his spin on it. Right. A more intriguing yeah. question would be, because Red Dead Redemption is so hard to film in, how, how did they he manage that shot technically yeah. inside of the Red Dead Redemption engine? I think there was probably a lot of work in order to make that shot and many other shots as well in it. So it'd be fascinating. I wish... We had the filmmaker here. If if you happen to hear this and you want to respond, we'd love to hear um, your thoughts about how making the film was. In fact, come and be a guest. We'd we'd like to talk to you about it. The, the last thing I want to talk about is the music choices, and I don't want to belabor this, but I think for one thing, the choices were how they were mixed was were a little strange. Because usually background music is background. But the problem with this is it was mixed in the foreground. So when the Chopin Nocturne came on, um, it was set, suddenly it filled what the film was about at that moment. It became the music and everything went into the background. Whereas a, a better mixing of it would be more gentle in and not taking away the action of the film mm. also the, that chopin piece has been done in countless films um it, it's so very very french and it pulled me out of the the world even though the the mood of the piece was right for the scene that it was in i think another music choice would have been better because it would have matched the american uh, western element of it and then the second piece with the organ, again, the mixing was all up front. And the organ was so predominant in it, and it was building up to a big action scene that it just seemed to be inappropriate. The organ has a kind of symbol in Westerns of being either connected to religion or death, I think. And neither one of those, I mean, death was certainly there because they People were dying left and right from the filmmaker or from the, the gunslinger, but it didn't somehow it just didn't work for me. I think there could have been better choices that would have integrated with the soundscape and that would not have been would not have been so so discordant mm. to me. But even with that. It did not remove the pleasure of the film. It pulled me out, but I still uh, came back and immediately reengaged. So maybe it's just my own particular choices in music. Um, but but still, the, this filmmaker deserves great accolade for the care and their obvious sentiment towards Westerns, as Tracy mm. pointed out. And I'm really hoping that they'll respond and that you go to their channel. We'll have a link to their channel and watch their other films. Absolutely. All right. Any... Um, yeah. Tracy, are you going to say something? No, no, I was going to say you had an honorary pick this month, didn't you? Are you going to? Yeah. Um, we'd have to go into it in quite a depth of that. It's, it's another film that I found. It's called The Second Base 
the second best space sim ever made. That's the name of the video. And it's made with, so we've seen videos made with Elite Dangerous. That's actually the fourth game in the series. So th this this video I found is made in the second game, which is a 30 year old game. And it shows off the scale of the game as it is, because it's it does something that many modern games still struggle to do. And that, and the way it is, you have a spaceship on the landing pad, and you get a little bit of explanation of what's going to happen. And the ship takes off, and he turns up, and he flies away, and it seamlessly flies up into space and away from the planet Earth, and it gets smaller and smaller in the, the background. And basically, the video is just showing off the technology of this 30-year-old video game that was able to fit on a single floppy disk. And it simulates the entire galaxy, at least as it was known back then. There's a lot more that's known about the galaxy now. Um, and this huge game managed to fit on one single floppy disk. I have no idea how they managed to pull it off because <laughs> I cannot imagine how you get that much data. Just the names of all the systems would fill it up. Um, so I don't know how they did it. But it, it's there. And, and this is a... It's not exactly a cinematic masterpiece because it is an old game. The camera angles are very limited. Um, it's not really moddable. So, you know, because modding didn't really exist the way it does now when this was made. So he, the filmmaker was, you know, limited by, you know, the limitations of the game. But I remember playing this game a lot and I was really excited to see someone had made something with it. Um, so I thought this is just going to be my honourable mention because uh, I don't think it, it could do with the whole episode, but I, I still liked it, so I wanted to share it. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, I thought it. I saw it, and I thought, is that a little bit of a joke um, that's going on here? Because it's 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 two D, obviously. Um, oh, it's three D. It's all three D. It's that's three D. It for thirty years ago. Okay, all right. <laughs> it's one of the very first three D space flight simulator games. Is that right? Well, yeah, yeah. It's it's certainly got nostalgia for it. It's obviously a run through. It's not an edited film. When I was looking at it, from my point of view, um, yeah, it's uh, you know it's it's interesting when the creator said the graphics have stood the test of time. <laughs> Maybe not compared to the new Elite Dangerous. I, no. I, I think the person um, that, that made this has an excellent sense of humour. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, let's face it, if you were not playing games 30 years ago, this sort of thing will have passed you by for sure. Um, yeah. I think given that the real time aspect wasn't particularly central to the finished film because of the way that the, you know, it's the it's the narration that kind of informed your, your way through this. Um I know it was badged as a sort of a real time thing, but it could possibly have been quite a bit shorter to make the same points about the graphic quality and the other observations. Although I get the point was not so much to show the content, but to expound about the game and its expansiveness, which I think this does pretty well. So, you know, if you're if you've got nostalgia for these kinds of games, I think this is a really interesting example of a run through with some some really uh, dry, humorous comments on the web. Yeah. Um, I mean, no disrespect to you, uh, Damien, and your choices, but I couldn't finish it. Um, That's fair. I just didn't find it interesting. And although I can see your and Tracy's point about there being a nostalgic enjoyment of uh, an old game and seeing how that was done, it just didn't appeal to me at all. And I don't really have anything to say about it. I'm sorry. Fair enough. That's fair. Uh, I just thought it's interesting to see someone make something with such an old game. I'd mm -hmm. like to see someone do something more than this, like a proper film with yes. this game. I'm not going to try it myself. <laughs> but yeah, if someone were to attempt it, I'd be very excited to see what someone could do with this old game because mm. there is it's, it's a huge world and this video kind of shows off the scale of it yeah. so i think there's potential there i just don't want to be the one that does it myself i want to see someone else do it okay. so yeah <laughs> well if you could clone yourself you could do it but yeah 
but it's yeah, not, that's... it's another interesting choice. I think we've seen yeah. interesting choices like this made with um with old older games. But I think the 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 bit that makes them more interesting isn't so much isn't so much the graphic quality and and what you see, but the way that the story is woven over it by whoever's doing the narration. And the narration here was 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 text based, which which was 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 fine, but um, yeah, I think that's where the work has got to come into using something yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, um, I think that's going to be it for this episode. So uh, thank you, uh, Ricky and Tracy. Welcome. Um, we look forward to Phil's return when he's able to. We hope Indeed. you enjoyed these uh, two films. If you do have anything to say about either of them, uh, please let us know. Uh, if you are secretly working on an Elite Two video that is going to be uh, more exciting than this one. Uh, please do let us know about that too. Um, send us your feedback at talk at completemachinima.com and our website is at completemachinima.com and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Take care and goodbye. See ya. Bye.